So I think I want to now stop my screen sharing and hand over uh, with that introduction to Athena Aktipas. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me as part of this amazing event. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started with my slides. Uh, so let me get those shared. All right, can everybody see me and my yes. slides? All right, so uh, what I'm gonna talk about today is looking at cooperation in the time of COVID, but through the lens of a broader project that I have called the Human Generosity Project, where we have looked at how humans in small scale societies help each other. So I'm gonna kind of give you the, that big picture first, and then talk to you a little bit about the work that we have been doing to look at changes in cooperation and perceptions of interdependence and some other factors um, since uh, the COVID pandemic began in March. So, really the motivating question for me for a lot of this work is to understand what human nature looks like during times of crisis. And, um, you know, it's, there are a lot of different perspectives on this. Some people think, well, you know, in the apocalypse, everybody is horrible to each other. Other people see it as, uh, you know, an opportunity where people actually come together where they otherwise wouldn't have. Um, so those are the kinds of questions that um, I look at in my work and especially in the Human Generosity Project. One of the big picture important things to remember is that we as humans have faced crises for the entirety of our evolutionary history. So it's really part of um, who we are as humans to deal with crises and to have to figure out how to deal with those socially. One of the things that we've seen in the Human Generosity Project is that across all the societies that we've looked at, um, people actually come to each other's aid in times of need. So um, let's get into the, the nitty gritty of the Human Generosity Project so I can tell you a little bit about some of these societies. So um, the Maasai in East Africa, they have a system called Osotwa. I'll talk to you a little bit about today. It's a, a system of helping um, herders who are in need. Fijian Islanders have a system called Kerry Kerry, which is also a need-based helping system. A lot of foragers have um, central place food sharing systems. Uh, ranchers in the desert southwest, not so far from um, where those of us at ASU are, um, they have a system they call neighboring, which is a need-based helping system. And a group of very interesting um, hunter, former hunters, um, now horticulturalists and gatherers called the Ik in Uganda, um, which I'll, I'll tell you about at the end of my talk. They have a, um, a cultural norm called Tamora Marang, which basically means it's good to share, um, which guides a lot of their behavior, especially during times of need and crisis. So let's just start with a bit of big picture here with need-based transfers. What are they? Well, the way that we think about them is that there's essentially two steps and then an outcome. Step one is that a request happens. And what, what will happen is an individual who's in need will ask for help, um, but only up to the point um, to what they need. So they won't ask for more than what they need, and they'll only ask if they're in genuine need. And then another partner will respond by fulfilling that request if they have enough to do that without going below their threshold for what they need. And then the outcome of this is that you get limited pooling of risk between the partners and better survival. So this is different from resource pooling where everybody puts everything into a common pot and splits it all. It actually still maintains private property in a sense, um, but individuals sort of agree to help each other if um, one of them is below the threshold for what they need in order to survive. So in the Human Generosity Project, a lot of our work has been looking at these resource sharing systems across small scale societies. And that's the bulk of what I'll tell you about in the coming slides. Um, but we also do research in the lab and simulation. So I'm gonna weave in um, some of those results as well. Uh, we have some bigger picture goals too. Uh, we're really keen to communicate with um, general audiences and with other scientists and other disciplines about our work. Um, look at how um, these need-based transfer ideas actually apply to bigger questions in the evolution of life and, and also apply our work to practical problems, including disaster recovery and now um, pandemic response. So 
one of the most important things that I want to sort of get across today is this idea that um, the ability to manage risk effectively is actually one of the big benefits of sociality in general. Um, and, you know, it might be a big benefit that we're not necessarily capitalizing on well enough in our current society. If we look at the Maasai of East Africa, they're pastoralists, which means they have livestock that they take care of and they rely on as their um, main means of subsistence. Now, they live in the Great Rift Valley, um, which is uh, a, a quite variable ecology, both over space and over time. Um, so there can be droughts and there can be times of plenty, um, and it can be somewhat unpredictable um, when one will have a, a good season or not. Um, so you have on one hand, all of these families um, who are being sustained by these herds, and they consume the milk and blood and meat from these herds. Um, so they really rely on them for their um, uh, daily needs of um, subsistence. But the herd growth will vary, and sometimes drought or disease or even theft can um, make it so that they don't actually have enough cattle for their families um, to, to survive. Now, the solution that the Maasai have sort of come up with for dealing with this uncertainty um, is called Osotwa. Um, and Osotwa uh, has essentially these two components. You ask only when you're in need, and you give if you're asked and able. So this is sort of our classic need-based transfer um, kind of idea. Now, interestingly, Osotwa um, directly translated actually means umbilical cord. So it has this, um, a connection really to this idea of you know caring for someone who is part of you in a sense and with also 12 there's no expectation of a payment back it's um, a gift that's given because the other person is in need and you have the ability to help now we know for sure that Osotwa really is not about some, you know, hidden expectation of return because the Maasai actually have a different system for account keeping. They call that sile. And um, that will uh, allow individuals to sort of um, borrow cows that they'll pay back. Um, but if something happens within Osotwa, then it really is about just helping in times of need and not about repayment. Now, it does help develop a relationship, but that's a very different thing than necessarily um, developing some expectation that repayment will happen. Um, so that's, a, I think, a distinction that oftentimes is lost in the way people think about reciprocity. But they're very, very different systems if we look at how they manifest uh, among the Maasai, for example. So one of the things that I did was I created a model to look at the evolutionary viability of the strategy. Most important thing you need to know about this is um, essentially I programmed agents so that they had also 12 partners and they were going through the realistic ecology that the Maasai go through and they could ask for help and um, give help. Uh, along these um, same kind of lines. And um, then I put them in a model and allowed them to use the Osotwa strategy um, or to use probabilistic strategies that were yoked to the same um, rates of giving and asking um, and helping. And what I found um, was that with the Osotwa rules, there was higher survival and a much stronger correlation between the survival of the two partners. So this um, Osotwa rule was definitely giving a survival advantage over the probabilistic version of those rules. Now, I wanted to know also how does this need-based transfer rule do in relation to a debt-based rule? Because a lot of the um, standard thinking has been that you know reciprocity is uh, in terms of you know payment, repayment, debt, credit, that that is how cooperation is most viable. So I wanted to pit the need-based transfer against a debt-based kind of rule. And um, what we found there was that uh, a debt-based transfer rule did better than no transfers, but the need-based transfer did even better. And um, you get this sort of very long tail of survival with the need-based rules, where some um, partnerships are lasting for a really, really long time. Um, so the, the debt-based rule is better than nothing, but the need-based rule is better than the debt-based rule. And here's another way of kind of comparing the two. I um, had agents who were debt-based and need-based also play against each other. And um, what I found was that two need-based transfer players will do better than any of the other combinations. Um, but interestingly, 
two debt-based players um, will do better together than a need-based player will do with a debt-based player. So what this means is that if, you're, if everybody is doing the debt-based strategy, it's risky to try to go to the need-based strategy unless you know everybody else is gonna to go to the need-based strategy. So you kind of get stuck in this um, you know, less optimal outcome because uh, if you're playing need-based and someone else is playing debt-based, you don't do as well as if both were doing debt-based, but you would all do best if you switched over to need-based. This is the equivalent of a stag hunt game in game theory. All right, um, so I also looked at how volatility influences this. And essentially what I found is that the advantage for the need-based strategy really comes from um, this, these intermediate volatility sizes. If things are so good that nobody is ever in need, or if things are so bad that nobody can survive, it doesn't matter which strategy you choose because either everybody survives or everybody doesn't. But in this intermediate space where um, you're really at the margin in terms of whether you survive or not, that's where uh, the need-based transfer strategy really makes a difference. Now, if we zoom out a little bit, we can see that need-based transfers are not just something that happen in humans, um, but other species also help in times of need. Vampire bats, um, they will share blood meals with other bats who are hungry. Um, the vampire bats can't survive more than two days without a blood meal. So uh, oftentimes there may be a bat who has more than they need and a bat who is very needy. And um, so they, they help each other in this way. And um, even insects. So um, social insects, ants in particular, um, have a practice called trophallaxis, um, where an ant who's just um, come back from foraging and is very full. If um, the, another ant taps on their antenna, then they will regurgitate some food for that ant that is hungry. So it's not just humans who do it. And in fact, it goes all the way down to the most microscopic of scales. Um, the transfer of nutrients that happens in a multicellular body is based on many of these same principles of resources getting transferred um, from those cells that have access to those that don't. So earliest stages of multicellularity was about, you know, bringing nutrients in from the outside. Um, now the way our bodies work, uh, our whole digestive system and our circulatory systems, all of those are really about um, getting resources to the cells that need them. So it's, um, it's cooperation all the way down, I guess you could say. Now, you might be asking if you come from an evolutionary perspective, you know, what, how is this need-based system evolutionarily viable if it, you know, maybe it's possible for individuals to um, ask for help if they're not in need, for example. Now, um, in traditional explanations for cooperation, um, this really does seem like a problem, but there's a, a, a new kind of perspective that my colleagues and I have been taking, which really brings together a lot of existing threads in evolution and social behavior kind of into one idea of fitness interdependence. So this is the degree to which um, organisms are positively or negatively influencing each other's fitness. And if you have a, a tight yoking, then that means that what you do for someone else also influences the outcomes for you. And um, that might not even be conscious, but it's just part of sort of the structure of how um, existence is, for, especially for social organisms like ourselves. Um, and fitness interdependence is a hugely important part of human relationships. Um, in oso trois relationships that we talked about earlier, you have this yoking of outcomes because of the need-based transfers that can and do occur. Um, in uh, families, you have high degree of fitness interdependence and also often among individuals who are not kin, but are in challenging situations like war or apocalyptic situations um, uh, of any sort. If individuals really have to rely on each other for their survival, then you have fitness interdependence. Um, same thing in disasters. And fitness interdependence can be very, very high in times um, of disaster. So um, we've done some work to measure um, fitness interdependence. And um, essentially what we found was that fitness interdependence strongly predicted willingness to help um, better than and better than um, genetic relatedness did. So uh, this seems like it's a really powerful um, uh, psychological motivation, um, even if people aren't, aren't so aware of it. 
Uh, and we also found that there's these sort of two components um, two fitness interdependence, one which is the sort of emotional empathetic engagement, and another is the sort of sense of shared fate. Um, and so, so these two components seem to make up this um, the scale that, that we've been developing. I'm going to jump now to tell you about a few other societies so that I can then um, show you our, our results from COVID. So one of our other societies in um, Human Generosity Project is uh, in Fiji, um, where they are hit by destructive weather often. And um, they have a norm called carry carry, which is essentially the same kind of idea of helping in times of need. It's typically used within villages. Um, individuals will carry carry people for help with their daily needs. Um, but what's interesting is that sometimes this, these destructive weather events will wipe out a whole village. And what that means is that everybody in that village is in need at the same time. And so this creates uh, another level at which risk has to be mitigated. And interestingly, um, the way that it seems like uh, Fijian society has sort of solved this risk management problem is that villages can have relationships with each other um, where they can ask each other for help. And so what it seems to be, what seems to be happening here is that they're sort of scaling these need-based transfer relationships based on the scale of the disasters and the risk and the need, which I think is a really um, important uh, issue and something that we might be able to take some um, guidance from if we want to apply some of these principles to creating better systems for um, resilience in our current society, in modern, more market integrated society. And just to kind of bring home how this is not just an issue in small scale societies, um, one of my graduate students, Jessica Ayers, has looked at uh, friendship and has found that in the US, the most important things that um, people feel about their friends um, include things like help me when I am in need. And some of the least important things are always pays me back when they owe me. So really many of these things that we think of as central to friendship are probably tapping into this sort of psychology of need-based transfers. So um, we, we probably have a lot of sort of tools already that we could draw from in terms of creating a more resilient society to, to risk. Now, one of the key factors that we have seen that is important for um, influencing whether people expect to get paid back or not is the unpredictability of the event that causes the need. Um, so this is um, in the desert southwest. We did a survey of ranchers and what we saw was that the predictability of the, um, the kinds of needs that occur, um, as the predictability goes up, people's expectation of repayment goes up. But for the things that are very unpredictable like illness, death, and injury, people do not expect to get paid back for help that they give in those circumstances. So that suggests that really a lot of this sort of psychology of helping in times of need has to do with helping people to deal with the uncertain risks that um, life can present. And I want to offer that this could be a, an interesting um, way for us to kind of reconsider um, some aspects of insurance because there are, are certain kinds of disasters that are just uninsurable because the likelihood that they will occur is unknown and the scope of the damage that would occur if they did happen is unknown. So you cannot actually, um, you can't have an actuarial table to calculate what um, premiums people should be paying. But um, some elements of these need-based transfer systems um, might, might be able to help with that. Now in the lab, um, we've also seen that people give to others in, um, when they're in need, if they're managing a resource, and also that a need-based transfer framing, if people read about the Osotwa norm um, or an, another kind of norm like the neighboring, that they um, gave more, they made larger requests also, they gave up more unconditionally, they asked more unconditionally, and they didn't match the giving and receiving as much. Um, and so this suggests that, you know, need-based transfer is actually, like the psychology is quite easily um, elicited by sort of presenting this framing, um, which is, I think is promising if we, if we want to leverage this potentially um, in the future. 
All right. Uh, and um, finally, in terms of our, our field sites, um, Catherine Townsend, an amazing um, postdoc on our project, did amazing field work with the ICK in Uganda. Um, now, the ICK are sort of infamous. Um, if you took an anthropology class at any point in your life, you probably heard about them. Um, Colin Turnbull wrote a book where he basically said that they were the worst people on earth. And um, this uh, actually had a, a huge impact um, on many other books and uh, a, a lot of the sort of perception that people have of, um, of, of human nature. And uh, Richard Dawkins even used them as an example in the selfish gene as a, of a culture um, where their norms, their cultural ideas were so selfish that, um, you know, they, they indicated that this was, you know, potentially one of the ways that human nature could manifest. So um, now it turns out that during the time that Colin Turnbull was there, it was a, it was a famine time. Um, and this was because the were forcibly settled. They had been hunters. They had been, you know, moving around with the herds, um, and they were put on really marginal land and not really given the tools that they would need or the supplies that they would need to survive. So it was a, a very difficult time. And um, now, well, actually, let me let me say a little bit more about this. When Catherine went there, it was very clear that this memory was still strong for people who had um, lived through it, and. Although Colin Turnbull acknowledged that this was going on, um, he nevertheless ascribed a lot of their behavior to their culture, saying that their culture was sort of, you know, promoting this, um, this bad behavior. Now, Catherine, when she was there, she found that they had very, very strong sharing norms. If someone um, is eating food, they always invite others to come and eat with them. And they have this idea of um, tomorrow more wrong, it's good to share. And they also have this cultural notion of the Kija week, which are forest spirits that um, bring misfortune to people who aren't generous and reward people who are generous. So um, she had a very different kind of view than Colin Turnbull um, of what was going on in terms of their cultural norms. Um, now, in order to add a little bit more um, quantitative rigor to the studies, uh, what Catherine did was um, gave them dictator games. So basically people are given a certain amount of money and they have to decide how much they're going to keep for themselves and how much they're going to give to others. And she did several different kinds of framings. Um, so in one of them, it was just a standard. Um, and in, in another, uh, we said that the person that they would be sharing with would be someone who would be needy. And then in um, the third one, uh, we just asked them about the Kija week. So she, you know, basically brought up the Kija week. And, and then we did a combination of need-based transfer, need-based framing and Kija week framing. And um, what we found um, is actually that the supernatural um, Kija week and needy recipient framing gave very high levels of cooperation. Um, here you can see a, a breakdown a little more if you want of that. And um, the, these levels of cooperation are comparable with cooperation in other societies, small scale societies. So there's no evidence that they actually are any less cooperative than anyone else. And in fact, their cultural norms seem to promote cooperation as opposed to promoting selfishness. So I think this really forces us to rethink um, these ideas about the ick that Colin Turnbull put forward. Um, so it's it really, it was a byproduct of famine that was causing a lot of this behavior. Um, it wasn't a matter of their culture um, being a culture of selfishness. In fact, the ick report more sharing, not less sharing when there are times of need. So to me, I see this as a really um, optimistic uh, a view, actually, because it, it's clear that their norms um, of cooperation, had, they broke down because of that famine, but then this need-based transfer um, culture really came back um, quite uh, robustly. So, um, you know, in the case of an apocalypse, you know, even if things get really bad and people are starving, probably human society will be able to, um, you know, recapitulate a lot of the cooperation um, that is just, you know, part of our species makeup. So let me um, 
talk to you just for a few minutes. I have a few little bits of data about the pandemic and how it's shaped our generosity and um, our perceptions of our interdependence using that interdependence scale that I talked to you about earlier. Um, so we've got an awesome interdisciplinary team. Um, we've got doctors, we have um, people in humanities, people in disaster response and recovery, uh, a bunch of psychologists, anthropologists, and we're all working together to uh, do a, a longitudinal study uh, on prolific with uh, an international cohort um, to examine changes over time um, in people's um, reported behavior uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. So we started our data collection on March 6th, um, which was before the pandemic was declared. Um, a, a few of us had a feeling that things were about to get real. So we jumped into action to put a study together and rush it through IRB. And um, so we're really, really lucky that we actually have this time point one, um, which is before uh, the pandemic really became, um, or what, before it was declared at all. Um, and, and we have data from a number of societies, mostly um, these are um, more Western societies because people um, in these, you know, in Europe and in North America um, have more access to technology and, and we ran this online. Um, so here's uh, one of our findings, um, which is that uh, people's um, willingness to help others in times of need, um, that it increased for some measures and decreased for others. So interestingly, um, people's willingness to let someone who's not a citizen of their own country live in their house for a week um, went up um, over that sort of first month um, from before the pandemic was declared to uh, the beginning of April. Um, but their endorsement of this idea that helping um, when helping people when they're in need is the right thing to do, the endorsement of that went down slightly. Now, we don't know if that's because maybe people were worried about interacting, right? This was when everything went into lockdown. Um, that's a, an open question. But um, at the very least, this tells us that these measures of um, willingness to help in times of need, they don't necessarily always go up and down together. Um, now, when it comes to interdependence, we saw a, a little more of a, um, a, a cohesive pattern here, um, where for most measures, it in, increased from the beginning of March to the beginning of April, um, that individuals uh, felt like their, they, they would rise and fall together with all of humanity and with their neighborhood. And also they felt like when their neighborhood succeeded, they felt good, that went up over time. And Here's a, a little wrinkle, though, or perhaps a suggestion of something deeper that's going on. Um, when we broke down that, um, you know, these um, interdependence measures with all of humanity by pre-existing medical condition, what we saw was that the changes, the sort of increase in interdependence over time um, was being driven by um, people who had a pre-existing medical condition. So maybe people who felt like they were more vulnerable and therefore um, they were more interdependent with all of humanity. So perhaps they had a greater awareness of that interdependence that's there because of that vulnerability. Our data collection is continuing. So I showed you just a tiny little piece of the beginning of that. We actually just completed our 14th time period. So we have about six months of data. Um, and um, we're also now looking at mask wearing um, and uh, kind of thinking about mask wearing as an aspect of cooperation that is um, really important now to decrease the burden on everybody else. Um, so we're looking at questions like, does mask wearing correlate with the number of social contacts? And um, I can tell you from our preliminary analyses that it looks like people who wear masks less also have more social contacts. So that is not necessarily the pattern that I wanted to find, but um, it does suggest that we might need to add some more subtlety to some of these epidemiological models um, because you, you have these very heterogeneous populations where you know, some people might be taking many more risks than others. Um, and uh, we also can get at this question of whether uh, 
whether people's reports of mask wearing in their communities predicts lower death rates in those regions um, by matching up our data with data from the Johns Hopkins database. And um, our preliminary findings suggest that, um, yeah, it does look like in regions where there's more mask wearing, where people report there's more mask wearing around them, that the um, death rates, the cumulative death rates are actually um, somewhat lower. So, um, so this is sort of where we're going now. We have um, many more, uh, many other variables we're looking at, like um, uh, I can also mention that uh, one of the strongest correlates of mask wearing we found was orientedness to the future, future orientation. So people who think about the future more, discount the future less, are also more likely to wear masks. I um, just want to thank my lab um, when we could all be together. This is uh, um, us at ASU and also the many other people and organizations that have helped to support this research and um, make all, all of our projects happen. So thank you and thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, Athena. I'm wondering if you have time for a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, if anyone would like to unmute or raise their hand, uh, we can go straight to you. I know I have many questions myself uh, and many parallels. Uh, is there anyone in the audience? Last week we were very chirpy. Um, I'm hoping the same today. Athena, I'll go to my first question while others are uh, getting their thoughts together. Yes, please. I'm just always shocked at your Ferris wheel, that, that wonderful diagram which shows cooperation. Could you flash to that, please, if possible? Sure. Because when I saw that presentation of yours, it literally changed the way I think about relationships. Mm. And I remember walking to your, your room to conduct uh, another activity and was blown away by its simplicity, but its applicability as well. Mm. All right. Here, here is the Ferris wheel. Yeah. So the idea here is that you can be in the same cart, right? So Katina and I could both be in that cart at, you know, number 12 together. So that means that if she goes up, I go up. If she goes down, I go down. So we're both in it together and we should do whatever we can, right? To keep our, our cart high up. Um, on the other hand, if uh, she's in cart three and I'm in cart nine, now our interests are placed at odds with one another. Um, and that would be like a, a, a zero sum kind of situation from a game theoretic perspective where I can only do better if she does worse and vice versa. Now there's a, many other possibilities, right? We could both be in the um, purple situation where we're somewhat aligned, but not entirely. Um, or we could, you know, one of us could be in the Ferris wheel and the other could be on the ground, or we could be in totally different Ferris wheels, right? So there could be no correlation between what I do and what she does um, in terms of the outcomes for us. And you can really take any relationship with any other human or any other organism, or even uh, maybe algorithms too, right? You could say, well, how do you, um, how does your well being relate to the um, fitness of that algorithm? Um, and uh, the, this is really a, a quite a general framework that allows you to, to plug in many different people. You could even do it with groups, right? So how does my um, well-being uh, tied to the well-being of my group or the institution that I'm a part of or my family? Um, yeah, it's, a, it's a, a very general framework that, um, that we think can be, can be useful. And, and the items that we've, we've developed as part of this scale are, are similarly general where you can plug in lots of different kinds of um, entities here, right? Where you have X here. Um, you could say when I or when um, my partner succeeds, I feel good. Or when my school succeeds, I feel good. Or when my workplace or my country or when all of humanity. So, um, so yeah, that's a, a, a brief return to the, the Ferris wheel. <laughs> and Athena Ektipas, I think that's what public interest is about. I think that's what you're talking about at its guts. If we use this almost as an approach to public interest technology, you know, the PPE that you're looking at, the masks, the personal protective equipment, it's tech. The, the COVID idea. apps, they're tech, yeah. And it's <laughs> like, I think you've actually got the answer towards the beginning of us understanding what is this thing called public interest and how do we cooperate? Mm. Um, 
We've got a question here from Toby Shuruf. Is it possible to transition from a, a non-needs-based transfer, social arrangement, to an NBT, to a needs-based transfer? Great question. So we have some hints of that in um, the modeling that I've done where, you know, what I found was that the need-based transfer situation, if both are playing need-based transfers, lower payoffs than both playing um, uh, debt-based is lower payoffs than both playing need-based. Um, and in order to go from a debt-based to a need-based, um, you have to solve the coordination problem, the game theoretic coordination problem, which is also called the stag hunt. And it turns out that the way that you do that um, in game theory is through coordinating so that you both move at the same time. Because if one of you moves um, before the other does, then um, the individual that did that movement is penalized basically. So um, given that we know that from the models and then given that we know from some of our experiments that it's actually very easy to get people to behave in a need-based transfer way by just telling them about Osotwa and telling them about ranchers sharing and helping each other in this way. Um, it suggests that you know we, we might actually be able to fairly easily flip into a need-based transfer frame if we realize everybody else is also hearing that message that that's what we're doing now because ultimately everybody will will do better in that frame now there's one caveat which is that of course it is possible to cheat in need-based transfers um and uh we we've done some work actually looking at to what extent do um people sort of monitor for cheating in need-based transfers and um it looks like people do do some of that um but what what's nice about need-based transfers is that you know if one is cheating in them oftentimes that just makes it so you in the long term don't have a social network so it can it can kind of have almost a self um, regulating property to it that you know if you um, are, are not helping others then those relationships can um, fall away because uh, you know part of how it maintains how, how the need-based transfer relationships are maintained evolutionarily is because the individuals that use the need-based transfer strategy um, tend to then have a larger network that they can depend on in times of need. So it, it's complicated. There's a lot more I could say, especially about the cheating thing, but um, I invite you to follow up with me um, over email if you want to talk more about it. That's great, Athena. And thank you, Toby, for the question. Uh, over to Eusebio, who's got his raised hand. He's from the University of Baltimore. Eusebio, go ahead. Hi, thank you, Katina, for putting this together. Can you guys hear me? Perfect. All right, Athena, fantastic. Absolutely love it and love how you pulled Thank psychology, you. game theory, and then uh, anthropology and so forth. Well, my question is, have you put some thought, I would to like to pick your brain regarding when those relationships, they are digitally mediated. So it breaks this temporary spatial continuum. A lot of the, especially when you look at Fiji or looking in Africa, there is a shared time and space continuum. So basically, you see those relationships immediately there. But then when those relationships are mediated through technology and they are uh, dispersed around different points of, of time and space, have you considered that as a variable? And, and what are your thoughts around that? I would love to hear it. Thank you. Thanks. That's a, a fabulous question. And, you know, right now with the Human Generosity Project, we're at this stage where we're trying to take a lot of what we've learned from small scale societies and at least tentatively start to say, well, how could this um, be applied to modern market integrated societies, to risk management and insurance, to, um, you know, increasing our resilience to risk as a society. And um, there are huge challenges, as you mentioned, with this shift from, um, you know, relationships being something that happen in a small community where people know each other. And, you know, if I know somebody, it's likely that many other people I know will also know them, um, which creates a sort of um, self-regulating system in terms of cheating. Now, when you start to move to an online space, um, those uh, networks can be a lot more fragmented, um, they can reach a lot farther, which has a lot of potential benefits, right? Um, our ability to sort of, you know, reach around the world and, and build those relationships. Um, but it also means that transactions can occur without any relationship, right? Like, and that's what we do all the time when we go online and buy something, right? I mean, we're having these 
you know, transactions with no human contact whatsoever. Um, and so once you start, you know, building this world where transactions are happening without any relationship, I think it's very, very hard to, um, to have a reliable need-based transfer system. Now, there's trade-offs though, right? Because the efficiency of the market system is great for um, you know, having lots of transactions happen with low friction. Um, but uh, in order to have, I think the trust that is needed for a need-based transfer system, there have to be you know, those relationships really underlying um, the, those transfers. So um, you know, how do we get the benefits of both today? I think is a really interesting question a really important question. Um, and, and I think, you know, if we can effectively say, okay, you know, these domains, this is where we need need-based transfer systems. In these domains, this is where we need the debt-based systems, kind of like the Maasai have done, where they have Osotwa and they have Sile. Um, but really, you know, if we can figure out how to formalize Osotwa so that it can also translate into digital relationships where um, we think that those will will be viable. Um, I think that that would be a, an amazing way to um, not just improve our ability to deal with risk, but also make us feel um, like we have more of a safety net, which in itself can be a really, really important thing for us as humans, you know, to know that, well, um, you know, somebody will be there for us if, if we're in need. Fantastic, we thank you. Thank you, Sabia. We have a, a comment on that very point uh, by Michael Sim uh, on the, if we're aware of the app Olio, which is a distributed platform for sharing food and other products that would otherwise be wasted. Do you have any thoughts on distributed sharing platforms? I, I think those kinds of apps are awesome. And there are a lot of um, online platforms that people used um, during the pandemic to share and to help. And uh, one of our hopes actually is that we will be able to um, study some of these um, transactions, um, some of these transfers that happened on, on apps um, to see how things changed um, from before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and, um, you know, as uh, hopefully will you know recover um, as we start to get a scientific grip on on what's going on. So uh, I I think there's I will say one caveat though about these online sharing platforms, which is um, kind of going um, to the previous question. When you have these online situations where you don't necessarily have relationships, there is the possibility of exploitation, right? And there have been some you know, really horrific examples of cons that have happened on these sites, like even neighborhood, um, neighborhood sites where people will pose as a neighbor um, on those sites. So I actually think that one of our most important um, goals as a society right now really should be to figure out how to um, educate people about those kinds of cons so that they can go into these kinds of apps and these online spaces um, with the confidence that they're not going to be exploited and you know to know how to avoid that i think that should just be you know part of like the education that you get when you know you're 14 and starting to you know use lots of online apps or maybe it's 10 or 8 now i don't know what the age is but i think that really should be an important part of um sort of online literacy is learning how to um, detect and avoid those, um, those kinds of cons and to not see it as like, oh, well, I might get cheated, so I won't do it, but rather I might, you know, this could be happening and it's all, it's part of all of our responsibility to make sure that doesn't happen so that we can build a trusting space online for, for people to help each other. We've got the chat going wild there, Athena. Um, there's a question and a comment by Nicole Stevenson, who says, wonderful, one of our other speakers. Uh, there's a great question by uh, Melissa Waite on loan repayments and need-based transfer societies. But I want to go to one last comment, just to be fair to all the speakers. Uh, and this was posted earlier by Robert Cook Deegan. Uh, Rob, can you uh, unmute? Yeah, Athena, I just wanted to say um, I'm always amazed by the breadth of your interests and how lively <laughs> and integrated it all seems. And I, it's so much to keep in track. But I was, I'm about two thirds of the way through your book, The Cheating Cell. And I was thinking if you could tell us how you're thinking about 
it's human societies is influencing your thinking about these collections of cells within the body and maybe even extrapolating that to what happens when a, something called a pathogen encounters something called an immune system and how you're thinking about that and how it relates to the stuff you talked about today. Sure. Uh, yeah, so my work really spans from looking at human societies to looking at uh, cellular society. So each of us is made of about 30 trillion cells that are cooperating and coordinating their behavior every millisecond so that we can do all the things that we do. And I see um, cancer really as what happens when that multicellular cooperation breaks down. So I talk about cancer as a cellular cheater because it proliferates when it shouldn't. It doesn't die when it should. It um, monopolizes resources. It doesn't take care of the environment, the shared environment that it shares with all the other cells. And it also doesn't do the jobs that it's supposed to do in a multicellular body. Um, now, if we wanna focus in just on the resource uh, monopolization issue, there's a, there's a real parallel here um, with the need-based transfer question because oftentimes what cancer cells will do is they will signal the body for blood, for resources, um, even for help um, repairing a wound when actually they're just there trying to exploit the, the body's um, response. So you can really think about cancer as a, um, as a set of cells that is cheating what is usually a need-based transfer system in the body for resources. Um, now, because we have this long evolutionary history where we have had to um, deal with um, cancer cells. Uh, this means that our bodies actually have evolved a bunch of mechanisms to keep cancer under control. So genes like TP53, many other cancer suppression genes, um, what they actually do is regulate the cells um, and essentially make the cells check themselves to ensure that they're, that they're behaving properly and not cheating the body. Um, and, uh, you know, part of that is also um, having an immune system. So um, the immune system really has evolved not just to deal with pathogens, but also to deal with cells that are um, behaving abnormally. So the immune system, you know, these genetic mechanisms like TP53, they are all part of our body's arsenal of cellular cheater detection systems that help make it possible for us to be viable. And, and I'll just you know, end by saying it's astounding that we are able to function, right? We're 30 trillion mm -hmm. cells that each are you know, processing information and responding and, and somehow it all comes together to make us who we are and to make us viable and to make us live, you know, for decades usually. Um, it's really astounding. So we, you know, perhaps can learn something from these cheater detection systems that our body has evolved, um, maybe even to help us deal with some of these challenges um, that are coming from the intense level of, you know, interaction and transaction that is happening in the online space now, um, many times not regulated in a way that necessarily promotes cooperation. So uh, I think there's a, a lot of exciting directions to go in terms of applying those principles. Thank you so much, Athena. Um, if in the chat window, you could write a link to your ZAM uh, podcast series, the conference, how people can register. I know you have to sure. go to your next event, uh, but everyone, you've got to register and you've got to watch Zam TV. I was hooked about three <laughs> nights ago. It's something completely different in academia. You simplify everything, Athena. It's so amazing. I just thank wanted you. to say thank you and for your generosity. My pleasure. All right. So I'm putting these in. So ZAM, um, zombiemed.org, that's the conference. Um, channel Z is the um, channel that it's like a television channel in the zombie apocalypse. Um, it's also the way that the most of the ZAM meeting is going to be taking place is through um, this channel. We have all sorts of fun shows. And then the podcast is Zombified. Um, I will put that in here too. So, and if you have any questions about it, any of these things, feel free to um, send me an email and uh, yeah, you can register for ZAM, zombify.org and on channel Z, you can check out our videos right on there, so. And just a warning, I'm zombified. I just <laughs> wanna to listen to you even more. So uh, I'll thank Athena and move.